Maybe stalking the woods is as vital to the human condition as playing music or putting words to paper. Maybe hunting has as much of a claim on our civilized selves as anything else. After all, the earliest forms of representational art reflect hunters and prey. To abhor hunting is to hate the place from which you came, which is akin to hating yourself in some distant, abstract way. Animals held a hugely important place in the lives of ancient hunter-gatherers. In big game hunting, the pursuit of megafauna was one of the most dramatic and dangerous parts of our prehistoric lives. Humans seem to have a fascination for the biggest, most impressive members of the animal kingdom. In fact, environmental activists looking to garner public support have learned to rely on these big, interesting animals as something like mascots, often symbolizing whole ecosystems and restoration projects that go well beyond a single species. The term charismatic megafauna emerged to describe this obsession of ours. This power of megafauna today to bring people together for collective action is, to me, a fascinating echo of their role in our prehistory. Over the last 50,000 years or so, a wave of megafaunal extinctions has swept the globe, in which most regions outside Africa and South Asia lost dozens of species. Giant beavers, cave bears, cave hyenas, woolly rhinos, mastodons, giant ground sloths, stag moose, civitherium, and many more. A debate has raged for decades over what role humans might have played in that extinction. But even setting aside that debate, these animals represented huge bags of calories, hides, bones, antlers, and ivory to feed, clothe, and equip Stone Age people. They must have been objects of fear, awe, and opportunity. Among the oldest myths in the world we know of, the cosmic hunt was first noticed by anthropologists comparing mythological tropes and cultures across the Northern Hemisphere. They saw that while subtle details varied, many motifs kept recurring. In one variant, a group of hunters pursues a big game animal across the sky, with the box of the Big Dipper representing the animal, and the handle representing the pursuing hunters. There are also little details shared cross-culturally, like a dimmer star in the handle representing a cooking pot in cultures as far apart as the Siberian Khanti people or the Iroquois. For others, that dimmer star is a hunting dog. Sometimes the constellation is switched. The Pleiades are a popular choice, where the stars represent a group of prey animals, surrounded by hunters and their dogs. People have even identified more distant descendant myths, such as the Tuareg story of Ursa Major as a female camel belonging to Noah, pursued by a group of seven noble hunters. Phylogenetic reconstructions of these myths have traced them back to a common origin at least 15,000 years ago, before the ancestors of modern Native Americans left Eurasia. Obviously, the details of that common ancestral myth are lost, but I still think it's amazing to see even faint echoes of Paleolithic thought. Anthropologists have long touted the idea that hunting was one of the key tasks we evolved to perform during the last several million years, with the emergence of stone tools, fire making, and even our big brains being deeply connected to the benefits of adding protein and fat-rich meat to our diet. But if you look beneath the hood, you'll find that hunting big game has always had a complicating risk factor. Not just physical risk of getting trampled by a panicked mammoth or hamstrung by a boar's tusk, there's also another form of risk, the risk of going home empty-handed, or having to give away what you killed. Imagine you're a hunter-gatherer. Like anyone, you aren't successful every day you go out. But today, you're returning to camp having killed a wild goat. When this happens, you're immediately confronted by a collective action problem. You have more food than you can eat right away, so for you the stakes are low. For some of the other members of your band who don't have so much, the stakes are higher. Any person who wants a share then will be hungry and motivated, and you can't say no to a mob. For years this problem has bugged anthropologists. From the hunter's perspective, the immediate value of the remaining meat is not worth fighting over, but it is from the perspective of someone who's hungry. There are a few explanations for how hunters might deal with this. One is reciprocal altruism, the idea that hunters provide meat to others when they experience a windfall, with the expectation that the favor will be returned when they're the ones coming home empty-handed. Another explanation, tolerated scrounging, implies that hunters will tolerate theft just in order to avoid conflict. 
Among the San, the maker of an arrow, rather than the person who fired it, is sometimes considered the owner of a kill. In this way, a hunter could intentionally use a friend's arrow in order to give them a claim to the meat, to develop a relationship, or to avoid provoking jealousy. Researchers have observed of the Hadza of northern Tanzania that hunters were not considered owners of the meat from the carcasses they acquired and did not control its distribution. All of this stuff deals with animals as food. You kill a deer, you get meat. Or your friend eats and owes you a favor. Your children eat well. Direct, individual payoffs. But there's a second line of thinking gaining steam which emphasizes more abstract elements of big game hunting. Most prominent of these is Zahavi's costly signaling theory, introduced from evolutionary biology to anthropology by researchers like Kristen Hawkes. Hawkes proposed that men primarily hunt large game as a form of costly signaling, like the ridiculous tale of a peacock that they survive in spite of. A costly signal is a way of telegraphing one's fitness in spite of the signal. Like that big dangerous animal you killed. Or that sports car you drive. Ultimately, the idea is that showing off in this way must have translated into greater reproductive success. Among the Miriam, a Melanesian people of the Torres Strait, successful turtle hunters signal strength, risk-taking, and in the case of hunt leaders, a variety of cognitive and leadership abilities to potential allies, mates, and competitors. This is where we start shifting to bigger stories of cooperation and collective action. Maybe some of the most challenging hunts became events, seasonal moments where people gather to trade, exchange marriage partners, renew their social bonds, and cooperatively hunt large, dangerous animals like mammoths and big herds of bison and caribou. There are some interesting arguments that suggest hunting technologies are deeply connected to this issue of communal or individual hunting. Atlatls require the hunter to make himself known, to move, and hence scare game. Atlatls can be used by individual hunters, but they are also suited to communal hunting, where hunters' movements are intended to channel game into the path of others. Meanwhile, a bow allows a hunter to remain hidden and to make little movement while firing. Bow hunting, therefore, is more conducive to individual hunting from a blind. This does seem to be a pattern among hunter-gatherers, and even in recent ethnographic studies, this emphasis on atlatls for communal hunting persists. In Zimbabwe, for example, Taiwa groups preferred to use the atlatl and dart, even while adjacent groups used the bow and arrow. They hunted large game, giraffe, rhinoceros, and elephant. To increase success, they also hunted collectively in groups. In Wyoming, Ice Age hunters might have periodically revisited the Colby Mammoth site trapping and dispatching one or a few animals each time and piling the bones as archaeologists later found them. In Alaska, ancient caribou hunters in the Brooks Range built huge systems of cairns and standing stones, often stretching multiple miles, to funnel herds into valley bottoms where, mired in alpine lakes, they could be dispatched from boats. In the Arabian Desert, there are remnants of similar structures called kites, used for cooperative hunts of gazelles, ostriches, Arabian oryx, onagers, and hartebeests. Over generations, considerable resources would have been devoted to building and rebuilding these kites, together with hunting and returning slaughtered remains to settlements and camps. This kind of hunting gave people a stake in the landscape. These were big seasonal events. Not just about food, but also about cooperation, kinship, and belonging. Hunting has always been more than just a way to eat. It goes right to the heart of our social and symbolic lives.